All right, what's up, guys? It is Monday, January 15th, 2018. This is the Daily Bitcoin Recap. I had three pieces published today. Uh, I think I wrote one last night, or one and a half last night, and then I wrote another, finished up the one, and then wrote another one this morning. <clears throat> No advertisers this week again. I'm finalizing a few different sponsors right now, and I don't think uh, I'll get started until next week with that. So uh, enjoy another ad-free week. But if you do know anyone that would want to advertise or sponsor the show or the newsletter, send me an email at email at kyletorpy.com. Um, I think I'm just going to cover <clears throat> the three pieces I had published today. And then I'll just also mention briefly here that it seem, it's official that uh, they're not going to shut down Bitcoin exchanges in South Korea, uh, at least not anytime soon. Uh, so, yeah. And there wasn't really any, there was a lot of regulatory news today, but there wasn't really anything else uh, too noteworthy. All right, so let's just get to this first one. Uh, I had two in Bitcoin Magazine and one in Forbes. This uh, first one in Bitcoin Magazine was about a article that the St. Louis branch of the Federal Reserve put out about uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Um, sorry, I was checking the chat there for a second. Uh, Remember, you can put in put questions in the chat, and I'll get to them at the end. So <clears throat> this is a report from the St. Louis Fed, and it was basically just like an intro to Bitcoin, other cryptocurrencies. I had a lot, a lot of a, uh, basic educational stuff about how it works technically and uh, you know some basic definitions of like Bitcoin, what's a blockchain, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but the, the interesting points from the article, at least the ones that I took, were uh, there's more like the analysis of what uh, how Bitcoin fits into the current uh, world in terms of like other fiat current or fiat currencies that are around the world right now. Um, I said right here throughout the article, Berenstein and Shar, who are the two uh, authors of the article, make the case that crypto assets are well suited to become a new important asset class. The duo goes as far to say that Bitcoin is in some ways more robust than many fiat currencies. Obviously, we've seen pretty clear cut examples of that with uh, Venezuela is like the most obvious uh, example where Bitcoin is, you know, pretty much objectively a better uh money or store value or asset to hold as opposed to like the Venezuelan Bolivar, which is uh, being hyperinflated. I haven't checked the rates recently, but I know over the past year or two, it's gotten out of control. Um, they also talk about how cryptocurrencies in general are a welcome addition to the current currency system. Um, here's a quote from the article. It says, Bitcoin is not the only currency that has no intrinsic value. State monopoly currencies such as the U.S. dollar, the euro, and Swiss franc have no intrinsic value either. They are fiat currencies created by government decree. The history of state monopoly currencies is a history of wild price swings and failures. This is why decentralized cryptocurrencies are a welcome addition to the existing currency system. So obviously, if you're using like the the dollar or the euro, you know, over the short term, uh, those are those are fine. You know, they don't lose much value over the short over the short term. And they're general, generally stable. But, the, you know, if you go back uh, before, you know, I mean, obviously, there's, a, there's still some examples of horrific monetary policy today, as we're seeing in Venezuela, or we've seen re recently in uh, other countries, Zimbabwe, uh, you know, wherever. Uh, these uh, these uh, fiat currencies do have a central point of trust in terms of monetary policy where they can just print more money, you know, at the discretion of, you know, the country's leaders. And as uh, Nick Zabo likes to say, who's like the, uh, the godfather of smart contracts kind of, uh, 
uh, trusted third parties are security holes. Uh, so let's move on here. So they did cover this this idea that you know Bitcoin could hard fork with and uh, you know increase the money supply that way. Um, but they pointed out that, that it's not likely to happen, uh, even though in theory, this is this is from the St. Louis Fed article, it says, even though in theory it is possible to increase the Bitcoin supply, in practice, such a change is, is very unlikely because a large part of the Bitcoin community would strongly oppose such an attempt. Uh, they actually had, they showed a pretty good understanding of the difference between hard forks and altcoins generally. They seem to indicate that, you know, Bitcoin Cash would basically just be an altcoin because you know there wasn't much support uh, for it at all. They indicated that you need like unanimous support for a uh, you know hard forking change to Bitcoin for the fork to be referred to as Bitcoin in the future. Um, so let's see what else we have. There's another quote from the article: "Undesirable changes in fiat currency protocols are very common, and many times have led to the complete destru destruction of the value of the fiat currency at hand." So this is the part where they argue that like Bitcoin is in some ways better than many of the fiat currencies that exist today. Article says it could be argued that in some ways the Bitcoin protocol is more robust than many of the existing fiat currency protocols. Only time will tell. So they're not saying like Bitcoin is definitely, you know, better than you know, a bunch of different types of fiat currencies out there today. But there's they're saying there's indications that Bitcoin is a better system than like what they're using in Venezuela right now, for example. Um, then it went on to talk about near the end of the article, it talked about some applications of blockchain technology. And then another section talked about the risks of blockchain technology. Uh, in terms of applications, they uh, really just, the, the only application they said that is clear that, you know, is useful and exists today is Bitcoin as a new type of asset. Uh, they see crypto assets in general emerging as their own asset class, as I mentioned before. And they also talked about uh, how Bitcoin could assume a role similar to gold over the long term. Uh, although they didn't mention like central banks holding it at all, which is something that um, that guy in Ghana that works at a, a uh, company, uh, multinational business in Ghana. I forget his name right now, but he's trying to get a central bank to put some of their reserves in Bitcoin. So there was no indication of that. Uh, they also talked about color coins, smart contracts, and data integrity as three other applications of blockchain tech. Uh, and then on the risk side, um, they talked about minority uh, splits like Bitcoin Cash or Bcash and Ethereum Classic on the uh, Ethereum chain. But they didn't really talk about why uh, those are problematic. I kind of put in here my own uh, two cents where I said one could argue that these sorts of minority forks create uncertainty around the value of a particular crypto asset. Although this is also the case with the creation of new altcoins more generally. So any, <clears throat> I'll kind of get to this point in the uh, Wences uh, Casares, or Casares, I think is how you pronounce his last name, article, where uh, altcoins generally and hard forks that split off from Bitcoin create like more uncertainty around the crypto asset space in general. So there is this, uh, you know, there's, and there's many different types of incentives uh, for everyone to build around the Bitcoin blockchain specifically. Uh, but I'll get that, I'll get into that into the more into that in the next article. Uh, then it talks about power consumption, uh, which is a, a argument that you hear a lot in the mainstream press, but uh, no one really I mean, uh, the authors of the uh, St. Louis Fed paper didn't really agree with that as like a, you know, serious issue. Uh, they talked about how it's hard to quantify how much the uh, current legacy financial system uh, consumes in terms of electricity. And they also pointed out that Andreas Antonopoulos has argued that power consumed by Bitcoin miners is used rather than wasted. Uh, that you hear a lot in uh, mainstream outlets that you know, there's all this power being wasted on Bitcoin, but you know that's that power does have a function in terms of securing the Bitcoin network. So it's not like it's going complete completely to waste. Like it's being used for something, and obviously the the miners uh, perform that work and use that electricity because they want to get rewarded with uh, new Bitcoin and uh, transaction fees. 
Uh, and then the last uh, risk they talked about was uh, Bitcoin price volatility. Obviously, uh, Bitcoin price has become more stable over time. Uh, generally, at least, you know, last year, volatility actually went back up quite a bit. So we'll see if things calm down in uh, 2018. Uh, but they, they talked about how, uh, you know, the Bitcoin's monetary policy could be problematic if uh, Bit Bitcoin were to try to become like a widely used uh, money or currency. Uh, I'll go ahead and read this quote uh, from the article and then I'll move on to the next piece. It says, if a constant supply of money meets a fluctuating aggregate demand, the result is fluctuating prices. In government-run fiat currency systems, the central bank aims to adjust the money supply in response to changes in aggregate demand for money in order to stabilize the price level. In particular, the Federal Reserve System has been explicitly founded to provide an elastic currency to mitigate the price fluctuations that arise from changes in the aggregate demand for the U.S. dollar. Since such a mechanism is absent in the current Bitcoin protocol, it is very likely that the Bitcoin unit will display much higher short-term price fluctuations than many government-run fiat currency units. But as I said, you know, if Bitcoin were to become like a widely used currency where like it's part of the financial system, as uh, Wences Casares, uh, Casares, uh, I'll get that right eventually, uh, indicated uh, in my next piece, um, you know, then then the price volatility would also obviously go down quite a bit and it'd be more useful as money. Uh, although it obviously would still be deflationary. All right, now I'll go to that Forbes piece. Uh, so Wences Casares is the CEO and founder of Zappo, which is a Bitcoin wallet, but he's also a board member at PayPal. And he was interviewed by, or he, rather he had like a conversation basically with the CEO and president of PayPal uh, on Facebook. And I think the interview was posted on Friday, I want to say. Uh, but the, the main quote that I pulled here for the uh, headline was, I can, once I said, I can imagine a world in which Bitcoin becomes a global standard of value. And he, he also talked about it being a standard of settlement as well. Uh, if you don't know, Casares was like patient zero, basically, in Silicon Valley for interest in Bitcoin. He was written about in that uh, Nathaniel Popper's Digital Gold book. Uh, if you haven't read that, you should read it. It's pretty interesting about the early days of Bitcoin and how it like grew in adoption over time. But basically he was at some uh, retreat for like big VCs and like CEOs of big companies. I'm forgetting names of people who are at this, but I think it was like someone from Business Insider, Mark Andreessen, uh, Jack Dorsey from Twitter, uh, Reid Hoffman who founded a, or was the CEO. I can't remember if he was the CEO or founder of maybe both of uh, LinkedIn. But basically, he like wowed all these uh, Silicon Valley types at this meetup, and then that's when uh, you know Bitcoin started to become bigger in uh, at least in Silicon Valley. Um, so yeah, he in addition to the uh, the main point of this article, I also want to go through his comments on uh, uh, first he was talking about blockchain technology, like what the banks are using, like distributed ledger technology, and then he was asked about altcoins too. So in terms of Bitcoin versus uh, blockchain, which is like a debate that's been brewing or going on for like the past two years, like roughly two years ago, it became fashionable for banks and people like that work at banks or certain companies to say like, you know, they're not interested in Bitcoin at all, but the technology of blockchain is like something that is very interesting. Uh, in terms of that, once they said that shows quite a lot of ignorance about the, how the system works, because that would be the equivalent of saying, I like the web, but I don't like the internet. Well, the web doesn't work without the internet. The blockchain doesn't exist without Bitcoin. So the point he's making there is that you, the whole reason that a, a public blockchain uh, exi can exist, and I, I probably should have clarified this in a tweet I sent out earlier where I said to uh, stop saying that blockchain is the underlying technology of Bitcoin and it's the other way around. I was talking about public blockchains there. Uh, private blockchains, you know, aren't really that, or a lot of people don't really find them that interesting. Uh, so I think most people think public blockchain uh, when they think blockchain, but you know, it's a fair clarification. Uh, but you, yeah, you can't have a public blockchain without an underlying token such as Bitcoin because the, the miners who secure the network need to have that financial incentive to do the work of, uh, you know, processing transactions and, you know, all the work that miners do. So that's the point he's making here. 
Uh, and then in, in terms of private blockchains, he says a blockchain of four banks, it's a database of four banks. It's nothing new. That's not really a blockchain. A blockchain is something where you don't have to trust any counterparty. And then he went on to say that Bitcoin is the only blockchain working at scale in this manner. And that is due to the financial incentives uh, around mining the Bitcoin asset. And obviously, the, as the Bitcoin price goes up, the incentive to mine Bitcoin and secure the network also goes up. Um, so yeah, and that, that goes to the, the, that's a great segue into the next point that he made when talking about altcoins. Um, he, he clarified his statement on altcoins saying that it's like, it's still very much an experiment. So this is a high speculation from him. It will take a long time for everything in Bitcoin and this technology to play out. But in terms of his best guess, he, he uh, compared it to the early days of the internet with when there was different competing protocols. Um, and there was people making like pretty good cases for you should use like TCP IP for low bandwidth applications, like surfing the web or email. And then you could use this other protocol called uh, X25 uh, that could be used for like watching YouTube or streaming on Netflix. Um, and this is this is very analogous to, you know, the crypto asset ecosystem today where you have people saying like Bitcoin is, you know, digital gold or the reserve currency of crypto assets and then ethereum is like for smart contracts or monero is for private payments but uh once it says that you know much like everyone everything runs through tcp ip today uh everything will eventually come back to bitcoin because here, here's his actual quote on this point he says even though it made some engineering sense it didn't really make sense as a whole he's talking about using different protocols for uh transporting different types of data over the internet there are huge incentives around tcp ip Today, the internet one and TCP IP transports everything, even things you never imagined at some point started being transported via TCP IP. And then I pointed out here that, you know, to his point, uh, the Lightning Network and side chains are kind of these like layers on top of the base Bitcoin protocol that are intended to bring these other types of applications to Bitcoin. And I mentioned that RSK recently launched the beta version uh, of their mainnet beta because I think they were in testnet for like almost a year. Um, RSK is like an Ethereum-esque sidechain for Bitcoin. Um, so yeah. <clears throat> and then obviously uh, a counterpoint to these uh, points that Wences was making in terms of building around Bitcoin is that the security model of sidechains and drive chains uh, is still somewhat theoretical at this point we don't we, there's no drive chains that have been launched even the rsk platform which is intended to be a drive chain eventually is, is currently just a federated chain of uh uh, uh signatories but I, I have become more convinced of the uh security model around drive chains more recently and maybe i'll i'll write a piece about that uh but i don't want to get off on a tangent on that right now uh so going on here, uh, Casares says the success of TCP IP was due to the incentives for everyone to build around a single robust protocol. In his view, the incentives around the use of one protocol for digital value transfer are even stronger. Um, so basically he's, he's imagining everything being built, uh, everything that having to do with the transfer of value being built around the Bitcoin blockchain. And obviously that, that would be beneficial um, if everyone did that, because then it would increase the security of the Bitcoin blockchain itself. You know, if if every proof of work altcoin didn't exist, that work would possibly be going towards securing the Bitcoin network instead. Although you could say, you know, if those altcoins didn't exist, then that value wouldn't have been there in the first place. Uh, but we'll see. Maybe. Um, a lot of mining power will migrate or maybe RSK should increase the mining power of the Bitcoin network itself because it's merged mined and, you know, it's just giving, it's increasing the revenue of miners basically with, through these additional features. Although personally, I don't find, uh, you know, Ethereum that interesting, but uh, I'm still waiting for it to prove me wrong in that regard. Uh, maybe I'm hoping for applications other than uh, crypto, crypto cats and stuff like that. Um, 
So you know, here's here's the, another quote I pulled from the interview. He says, I think we're going, when, this is Wednesday, he says, I think we're going to have one blockchain for value. There may be other use cases that do not entail value that merit a different blockchain, but in terms of value, it's most likely, in my opinion, that we're going to have one. And right now, the most likely one seems to be the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, he also talked about how he gives Bitcoin a 20% chance of failure and a greater than 50% chance of success in the interview, which I, th I think he said that before, so that's not like any big news. <clears throat> now, this is the part that I uh, hinted at in the title of the piece. Um, it was actually a pretty interesting point in general. Where he made like the boring case for how Bitcoin can succeed just by doing what it's doing now. Uh, I'll just read this first paragraph because it sums up the uh, the rest of the section. He says, while there is a large amount of excitement generated around Bitcoin in Silicon Valley and Wall Street, Casares is of the be belief that the crypto asset network's road to success could be rather boring. Casares claimed that Silicon Valley is waiting on a killer app and Wall Street would like to see more use of the technology as a payment payments mechanism. However, the Zappos CEO can envision a world where neither of these scenarios play out and Bitcoin still succeeds. So that was like that was me like paraphrasing what he was saying. And then here's his actual quote where he followed up on that point. He said, I can imagine a world in which neither one, in which they keep waiting and they never see the killer app and they never see payment adoption. Yet Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies win and people are forever late. So there he's talking about people in Silicon Valley waiting for a killer app and not buying any Bitcoin or Wall Street people waiting for a payment solution and not buying any Bitcoin. And as they keep waiting, the Bitcoin price keeps going up and more people are using it. And eventually, you know, they get in forever late, as he said. So in this scenario where, you know, there's no killer app and not much payments use, uh, he basically sees Bitcoin as a global, global standard of value and a global standard uh, settlement system. And he also talks about how the need for it to be apolitical. Um, so here's his actual quote. I can imagine a world in which Bitcoin becomes a global standard of value. It's the first global and non-political standard of value, coupled with the first global and non-political standard of settlement. That would be super powerful. It doesn't really need a killer application or much payment adoption to become that, but that would change the world as we know it. It would be the biggest leap forward in the democrat democratization of money we've ever seen. And then I went out to uh, point out that uh, Bitcoin's role you could argue that Bitcoin's role as an apolitical store of value was solidified by the SegWit2x hard fork proposal uh, failing. It had like 90% minor support and some of the big companies in the space were supporting it, but they couldn't push it through against the will of uh, uh, users once they saw the, you know, the futures market price of the fork. Uh, ironically, uh, Casares or Zappo was a supporter of the New York agreement Although uh, Wednesday did, uh, I don't know. I don't remember if he like apologized out front or up outright. Uh, not that he would, you know, owe that to anyone necessarily. But he he pointed out that it was a mistake. I should have included that uh, tweet uh, in the article. Actually, I think I'm going to go back and add it later. Let me make a <clears throat> note to do that now. Um, all right. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, the final point here is that he says, uh, success looks more like the same and, uh, it could be like boring to track the, you know, adoption of Bitcoin. Cause he, he made an analogy to tracking the adoption of email. It would be boring. It's just like you, you see more people using it every year and there's not really much else to say. Obviously with Bitcoin, it's much more exciting cause you know, you got the price, uh, bubbles and all that kind of stuff. All right, let me see what time I'm at here. 24 minutes, looks like I'll have time to get through this last <clears throat> article. And then I'll get to questions if there are any, go ahead and put them in the chat. So there was another paper from, this is for, I wrote this one for Bitcoin Magazine too. This one was from a Credit Suisse, which is one of the 40 largest banks in the world. They have more than $800 billion worth of total assets. That's according to Standard & Poor. But basically they wrote like an analysis of the current state of the Bitcoin market and called it a, a bubble. Uh, they called it an obvious bubble and they referred to the 
the uh, irrational exuberance in the ICO market uh, as a clear indication of the Bitcoin bubble. Even though a lot of times, you know, you don't invest in an ICO through Bitcoin, but it's all like create, it's all related and uh, part of the same market kind of. Um, obviously, Bitcoin has proven itself a lot more than the uh, concept of an ICO. Even though Bitcoin's still been around for less than 10 years at this point, too. Uh, so some analysis on the ICO market included in the uh, report. Uh, this, <clears throat> this is a quote from the report. It says, these ICO tokens off, often trade at penny stock prices, experiencing dramatic price increases within hours, and are often trading at very low liquidity. Most of these companies merely offer a so-called white paper, basically a business plan that explains which product the company wants to develop in the future and how it wants to market it. Most of these promised projects are praised as having huge potential, but are extremely uncertain to be actually developed. Uh, they went on to say the ICO boom uh, may continue to uh, may go on further. Um, they pointed out that after the SEC started warning investors F about ICOs, the amount being raised by ICOs actually increased. Uh, I'm not sure if I included it in the article, but in December alone, uh, ICOs raised over a billion dollars for the first time. So this is still a, a phenomenon that's very much active and ongoing. Um, they also talked about, they compared ICOs to the dot-com bubble, uh, and they but they clarified that, uh, or wait, did I not include that? Uh, maybe not, but they clarified that, like at least in the dot com bubble, com there were actual companies with cash flows, and you know they were like delivering a product or service. With the uh, ICOs, it's just like a useless token um, in most cases, or nearly all cases. Uh, they went on to say that most investors acknowledge the bubble situation. However, these investors argue that the central bank's easy money will help the bubble mania grow bigger and bigger. That's attracting even more investors, uh, in parentheses, speculators looking for easy profits. They remain bullish because of the greater fool theory. Um, and then they, <clears throat> then they talked about um, Bitcoin as a, as a currency. Um, they didn't really talk about how to value Bitcoin based on its use as a currency, which is a, a good sign because that's not really how you should value it. Uh, they talked about it as a new as asset class. Um, they did talk about uh, the issues of using Bitcoin as money. Um, they talked about the enormously high Bitcoin price volatility makes it unsuitable for a reliable day-to-day -day exchange medium. Um, most of their criticisms in terms of Bitcoin as a currency revolved around its inability to act as a unit of account. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Yeah, they also talked about how you know, if the entire world used Bitcoin, it would be detrimental to the overall economy in their view. Uh, or I don't remember if it was in their view or if they thought mainstream economists would uh, hold that view. And because of that perceived negative impact on the economy, uh, they, they believe authorities might or governments might start try to like crack down on Bitcoin more generally. Uh, and they also talked about how the like the potential to use Bitcoin anonymously is another reason why we could eventually see like some countries ban the possession of Bitcoin. But in terms of uh, uh, you know banning Bitcoin due to um, you know the negative effects it could have on the greater economy, in their view, they said uh, based on historical precedents, it's not unthinkable that in times of economic or financial crisis. Political and regulatory pressure on an unwanted currency would increase, possibly in a similar manner as in the U.S. in 1934, when the Gold Reserve Act of 1934 was ratified, nationalizing all gold and subsequently revaluing it by 69% in U.S. dollar terms. And then I pointed out that the, uh, you know, Bitcoin was designed to be res resistant to this sort of government coercion. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, you someone could knock like a government employee could knock on your door and ask you to or tell you to turn over your bitcoin but you know bitcoin is uh digital and it's data so you could just hold your bitcoin or a pass freeze for your bitcoin private key in your head 
and they're, they aren't really going to be able to take that from you. Um, and then, yeah, so I said Bitcoin is kind of like a bit torrent for digital free market money in that regard. Um, and, they, yeah, and then they talked about how the Bitcoin bubble could continue. Um, this was their main conclusion right here. The quote says, we believe the most realistic scenario for Bitcoin based on the premise of the currency not being banned by major regulatory agencies is that it will continue to rise in price in the short to medium term with increased institutional demand prior to the initial hype fading. At that juncture, Bitcoin's monetization or return prospects or return prospect realities will begin to set in. And if history is any guide, eventually dominate valuation. So they, their their conclusion here is that Bitcoin is in a bubble, although they don't discount, um, you know, the long term uh, use of Bitcoin as money. Um, in terms of what's, uh, you know, causing this bubble in Bitcoin and ICOs, they say borrowing money for free and having easy access to capital and leverage for big entities is the fuel asset bubbles crave. By aggressively mitigating the effects of the 2008 financial crisis via unparalleled global monetary debasement extending for nearly a decade, central banks have brought us today's bubbles everywhere investment landscape. Uh, and then they, they did mention that, you know, Bitcoin has not exactly um, gone along you know, like if uh, it doesn't really follow the, the stock market in terms of going the price going up and down. Um, but they they were thinking like if there was a serious, um, you know, market event where the stock market was crashing and we went into some sort of recession, that that could also bring an end to the Bitcoin bubble, um, even though it hasn't tracked the stock market in the past. And this is a point that Jim Rickards uh, has made in the past as well. We don't really know how Bitcoin would act in a serious uh, economic crisis. And that's pretty much it for that article as well. Now I'll check the chat for questions. Let's see what we got here. Randall, Randall, Randall Krott says, do you know any of these over 1300 tokens or coins that are actually making any money other than the money they receive from an ICO. Um, it depends on, are you talking about like the coin providing dividends? Or are you talking about like the company behind the uh, token making money? I mean, obviously they don't give up uh, equity when they sell these tokens. So I, I think I remember um, some company that did a token sale. It might have been Civic. They reported their um, the money they took from the OC, ICO process. Uh, they just reported it as profits, like whatever their share of the funds raised were. But I'm not, I mean, in terms of, a, if you're talking about just like a successful ICO, then I guess Ethereum is the closest thing we have to it. Um, but we'll see if that continues. Um, this, all these ICOs are like um, on another ICO, like Ethereum's use case right now is CryptoKitties and uh, ICOs. So if ICOs turn out to be not a good idea, then Ethereum might crash as well because that's what everyone's using for it basically right now. Um, so yeah, and it looks like there aren't any other questions, so I will end it here. Uh, make sure to like this episode and subscribe on YouTube. When you subscribe, if you hit the little bell next to the subscribe button, you'll get a notification when I go live. Uh, so make sure you can watch live, even though you can watch this on demand or listen on SoundCloud as well. Uh, you can find all the links to the newsletter and my website and SoundCloud and everything in the description or go to kyletorpy.com. And uh, thank you for watching. And I will be back around the same time tomorrow.